All right, so welcome everyone to today's CMTC seminar. It is a great pleasure to welcome Pablo Rio Ferrero as our uh, speaker today. Um, so Pablo is uh, currently a professor at MIT um, after doing his PhD at Delft with Leo Cohenhoven. And um, it's particularly great for me to be able to welcome Pablo here today because uh, his group was my introduction to research. I uh, spent some of my time in undergrad doing uh, or exfoliating graphene uh, and playing with the SEMs and the AFMs at, uh, in Pablo's lab. And so it's really great to have to have him here. Um, and it's he's of course a, a renowned expert in everything 2D electronics. Um, Twistronics, graphene, everything of the sort. And so today he's going to be telling us about uh, Moray Magic 3.0. So welcome, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danny, for the kind invitation and, and, and Sankar, too. I think the invitation came from both of you. It's a pleasure to, uh, to give a talk for my the Maryland community. As you know, I have plenty, plenty of friends there and also former group members as as Danny just mentioned I Danny I believe it's still one of your most cited papers you know your most cited paper is probably the work you did uh, exfoliating graphene in my group published in nature materials so you know that's correct yeah <laughs> <laughs> Danny Danny is an expert not only a theory but also the experiment you know it's really great okay so again Thank you very much for the invitation. I want to tell you about some quite recent work, you know, and which I, you know, I, I chose the, the title of the talks, More Magic 3.0, means it's it's almost it's about three years since we you know discovered uh, superconductivity and correlated insulator states in in magic angle graphene. But as you know, the 3.0 has more to do actually with what you see on the screen. The fact that we keep adding layers you know to to our more systems and finding you know more magic so let me let me go ahead so you know i think that you know many of you are familiar with with more quantum matter and indeed it's a very remarkable you know type of systems these more systems that have given us many types of um, you know condensed matter behaviors but with a new twist right so when you look at more systems, you know, you have that, you know, the community has discovered, you know, correlated insulator states in many more systems, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, seen MATBG, but also ABC trilayer graphene aligned to HBM, twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, transition metal dichalcogenide more heterostructures, etc. This is in fact the behavior which is more commonly seen, the correlated insulator states. Then you have superconductivity which has been discovered in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene and some signatures in others. I'll comment on this in a moment. Then you have various types of topological phases, such as you know, quantum anomaly of soul systems, chair insulators, etc. And this has been seen also in many, many heterostructures. You have magnetism, which has been also seen in a number of examples, nematicity, okay, so far seen only in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, but probably so in others. And even as of a couple of weeks ago, more ferroelectricity, okay? Which has been seen in twisted bilayer boronitride, okay? So this is boronitride on boronitride. And then also uh, our group last week in nature in bilayer graphene aligned to HBN. So I think it's fair to say that the phase that has attracted the most um, interest, you know, uh, perhaps is superconductivity. And, Partly because of it, it, because how unusual it is and how it appears, and also because of the uh, issue of whether it appears only in magic angle graphene or in other systems too. Okay, so magic angle twisted bilayer graphene is the only system where robust superconductivity has been reproduced by many groups. Okay, and what do I mean by robust superconductivity? I mean that first of all, you have a you know, transition from a resistive state to a zero resistance state, okay? It's a hallmark of superconductivity. You have flat voltage, you know, current bias characteristics with a sharp switching to a normal state, okay? And more importantly, perhaps, you know, you have also Josephson phase coherence, okay? Establishing clearly superconducting 
uh, behavior in the system. So this, you know, these data are from you know a couple of our papers, but this has been reproduced by now by many, many, many groups. Okay, Columbia, UCSB, ICHO, Caltech, Princeton, Ohio State, Brown, ETH, Stanford just told me that they reproduce also several of these things. So this has been reproduced broadly and and you know by all over the world. Now. This is a little bit in contrast to the signatures of, you know, what you know, maybe we could call fragile, perhaps with question mark superconductivity in other Moray systems. Okay. So you have, you know, the first report was on trilayer graphene, ABC trilayer graphene on HBN. Yeah? Then there were results on twisted bilayer, bilayer graphene, twisted transition metal dicalcogenides, more recently, more twisted monolayer graphene on bilayer graphene. In all of these works, there are signatures of superconductivity. Okay, the key signature is typically a resistance vector's temperature curve with a transition to a low, and in some cases, even zero resistance state. Okay, like you can see here, this black trace for twisted bilayer, bilayer graphene from the Philip Kim group. You know, you have a decrease in resistance to what seems like a zero resistance state. Okay. And this occurs frequently near a correlated insulator state, et cetera. So it's similar, you know, to some extent, similar features to what is seen in magic angle twisted by graphene. However, there are also some key issues. For example, the nonlinear VI curves uh, are not sharp. They don't have sharp transitions, you know, switching behavior. Okay? There have been no reports so far in any of these systems of just some phase coherence. For example, these Van Hofer like patterns. And the reproducibility has been very limited in these features. Okay. Very few reports and sometimes conflicting reports. So, although it might well be the case that these systems also exhibit superconductivity, if they do, it seems to be very fragile. Okay. And I think the community is still exploring to see to what extent these are true superconductors or something else is going on. Now, is that really leads to the question of, you know, is magic angle twisted by graphene the only robust more superconductor, okay? And what I'm gonna tell you about today is that the answer is no. Okay, I'm going to present to you another robust more superconductor, and this is mirror symmetric magic angle trilayer graphene, okay? So with this intro, let me tell you, so I'll first introduce uh, MATBG, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, and MATTG, magic angle twisted trilayer graphene. Then I'll tell you about our observation of robust superconductivity, about how tunable the phase diagram of the system is. In many aspects, the system is even more interesting than magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. Then I'll tell you about our observation of ultra strong coupling superconductivity, and then about the deep connection between the new equals two state you know, the broken, you know, the flavor broken symmetry polarized state at new equals two and superconductivity. And then I'll end with a summary and outlook. So let me start by telling you about this. So, you know, I think probably most of you are familiar with magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Yeah? The, as you know, the, you know, when you put a graphene sheet on top of another graphene sheet, you know, the real space with twist angle, the real space lattices are rotated. The reciprocal spaces corresponding to each graphene sheet are also rotated, okay? And you can form a super lattice Brillouin zone, okay? Which is a small Brillouin zone because you have a large more wavelength in real space, means a small Brillouin zone in momentum space, okay? And this happens because the direct cones of the two graphene sheets can couple because there's interlayer tunneling, okay? And this gives rise at an angle of about 1.1 degree to a flat band. Yeah? This is a picture of the electronic structure at, you know, including lattice relaxation at this angle of 1.05 degrees, where you see there is a flat band, okay, which is separated by band gaps from the remote more bands. Okay. So this was uh, studied theoretically almost you know, a, a decade ago, pretty much. And there were some early indications in the group of uh, in the work of Ivan Dres. STM group that indeed some form of singularities go towards zero energy at this angle, meaning something special really is happening at this angle. Okay? Now, when you put your chemical potential in these flat bands, what you know, my group discovered uh, a few years ago was that you find these correlated insulated states and superconducting domes, okay? And this thing happens only 
in a relatively narrow angular range around these 1.1 degrees. Let's say that the magic in magic angle twisted balayagraphene happens from about 0.95 degrees to 1.2 degrees. You know, recently we have a superconducting device at 1.25 degrees, you know, but extremely weak, you know, some tails going. But most robustly, this behavior occurs, you know, from one to 1.2 degrees rotation angle. Now, this is the phase diagram. This is again a cut of the electronic structure of magic angle twisted balayagraphene. You have in blue the set of flat bands, and in red, this other more dispersive Moray bands, okay? And in the phase, you know, this is schematic phase diagram, temperature versus doping, which I'm calling now here filling factor nu. This filling factor nu indicates what is the number of electrons or holes per Moray unit cell, starting from charge neutrality. Turns out these flat bands can hold up to eight electrons yeah, per more unit cell, which means from charge neutrality, you can have either you know, one, two, three, four electrons per more unit cell. Then you reach a band insulator, this band insulator, the single particle band insulator, or minus one, minus two, minus three electrons, or one, two, three holes per more unit cell. Then you reach the other band insulator here, okay, single particle gap. And now this phase diagram, you know, you should pay too much attention to details, it's schematic. It's very, it's a strongly twist angle theta dependent, and it's evolving very fast as we find more and more phases and more interesting, you know, correlated behavior in the system. Yeah? Nonetheless, a sort of a schematic global characteristic is that typically at each integer number of electrons or holes per mirror unit cell, something happens. Most frequently what happens is that you have a resistive, sometimes a correlated insulator and insulator state that happens very frequently at nu equals two, nu equals three, and nu equals minus two. And then at some other integers, sometimes you find an insulator, sometimes a semi-metallic state. <coughs> In particular at one and minus one, uh, what you see is typically a correlated semi-metal state, not an insulator. At the charge neutrality point, more frequent, most frequently you find a Dirac semi-metal state, but sometimes a Dirac insulator state, okay? And this has been seen by many, many, many groups by now, okay? And some of the early work is, is, is listed here. Hey Pablo, now, may I ask you a question? Yeah. I should know, but I never ask. So in this schematic phase diagram, where you do not have <laughs> one of these interesting phases, you know, the CI, SC, all the light blue, should I think of those all those light blue as metallic or semi-metallic all the way down to low temperature? For the most part, yes. <clears throat> But they are interesting. That doesn't mean that it's a boring metal because actually quite interesting things happen in the light blue area. And yes. sorry, just okay. before I go on answering that question, of course, it's, you know, it should be obvious from the diagram, but I should have mentioned it explicitly. These dark blue domes are superconducting domes, okay? The most widely seen, the one that appears in over 90% of the devices, of the magic angle devices, is this one when you dope with extra holes the correlated insulator state with two holes per more unit cell. This dome is in 90% of the devices, the largest and the most robust and present. I would say in about 50% of the devices, we see also the dome at two electrons uh, plus some electrons per more unit cell. And in a smaller number of devices, we see these other domes which correspond to, in this case, electron doping around the correlated insulator that is for holes, in this case for hole doping, around the correlated insulator state for two electrons. And now in these light blue regions, all kinds of things happen. People have seen linear in temperature resistivity behavior, very reminiscent of strange metal, nematicity and uh, anisotropic phases, cascades of phase transitions to flavor polarized states, which occur at temperatures much higher than the correlated insulator states at superconductivity. These phases we can see up to 50 or 70 Kelvin. So a lot happens in this light blue area, okay? Uh, Pablo, can I ask a short clarification? Sure. What you call a uh, correlated semi-metal, does that mean that it has metallic conduction but zero Hall effect? Is that what that means? Uh, no. What it means is that there is a peak in resistivity versus density at nu equals one, for example. Okay, if you cross here, uh, you measure resistivity at this line, you would see a peak in resistivity versus density, but that peak 
is not an insulated state. You know, you see a peak also here, but this one has an insulating temperature dependence. The resistance at low temperature increases as you decrease the temperature. For this one, the resistance decreases as you decrease the temperature. So it's metallic, but there is a resistive peak here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Pablo, yeah, uh, yeah. I want to ask uh, how about the uh, superconductivity in the between feeding factor zero and one or minus one? Those are not, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, so there have been, you know, all in all, maybe there are about something of the order of 40, 50, you know, maybe 35, 40 superconducting devices published in the literature. You know, about 20 of those are, are, are from my group. There has been one report Okay, or a couple, uh, a couple of reports, I would say three or four reports of superconducting domes in other regions, including one device, one report of superconductivity in this inner region, okay, between zero and one or zero minus one. So those are very rare. We're still not sure of why and when do such devices happen, okay, but it's the least frequent. Okay, thank of the, you. Of the observations. Okay, so now, the other thing that I want to tell you about um, material graphene is this, you know, the, the previous phase diagrams comes from, com from transport measurements. If you do compressibility measurements, you know, if you try to measure the chemical potential and its derivative with respect to charge density, and that's the inverse compressibility, uh, together with our colleagues at the Weizmann Institute, which is a group of Shah Halilani, we observed this cascade of phase transitions. Is, as, as it's known, and there was related work by the group of Ali Yazdani, and we have done uh, separate work on this doing global compressibility measurements. So what this refers to is the fact that if you measure the, compress the inverse compressibility, the mu dn, okay, this is essentially the inverse density of states, you know, in a single particle picture. What you see is that for magic angle samples, you know, let me, you know, as a function, you know, this inverse compressibility is a function of filling factor, okay, shows this sawtooth type of behavior that happens near each integer, okay? Let me do a zoom in, okay? This is d mu dm, inverse compressibility as a function of filling factor. You can see that starting from charge neutrality, at each, near each integer, there is this sawtooth behavior. This sawtooth behavior can be understood as Coulomb driven, okay? Coulomb interactions driven series of phase transitions where the system decides to flavor polarize, okay? What do I mean by that? Okay. In the simplest interpretation, this is still very much being investigated theoretically and better models are continuously, you know, happening. But in the simplest to zeroth order, what we believe is happening is that if you start from charge neutrality, because graphene has this four degrees of freedom, you know, two degrees of, you know, two flavors, spin, which can be up or down, and valley can be K or K prime, okay? What you do is you start with these four valleys, if you want four Dirac cones near charge neutrality, which as you add charge density, all four start being filled simultaneously at the same time, kind of. Then at some point, it becomes advantageous for the system rather than continue filling the four flavors, all four flavors at the same time, okay? It becomes advantageous to fully flavor polarize a single flavor and empty the other three flavors close to charge neutrality. So the occupation of one flavor goes to one and all other three flavors go close to charge neutrality. And then you start all over. You fill these three flavors. When you're close to one third filling of each of these flavors, okay, which means close to two total filling factor, then again, the system decides to flavor polarize two of these empty the other two and you go on, okay? So this cascade of phase transitions, okay? In a simplest model can tell you about this type of behavior, okay? Now, let me tell you about mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, okay? So this is a system where you have three graphene sheets, okay? You put one graphene sheet, then the second sheet you rotate it by an angle minus theta, and then you put a third sheet that do rotate by an angle theta with respect to the middle one. This means that actually this top layer is exactly on top of the bottom layer. So the stacking is A twisted A stacking. Yeah? And it's important that this top layer is exactly aligned with the bottom layer. And not only just aligned angularly, 
in terms of lateral shift, all atoms are on top in this layer on top of this layer. This was, I, th I believe, first analyzed by the group of Ashwin Bishwanath. There have been related, you know, lots of related work on mirror symmetric magic angle twisted trilayer graphene and related work on twisted trilayer and multilayer systems with different, you know, angles, etc. And I'm forgetting, by the way, here, uh, interesting work by the group of Jose Lado, which I'll, I'll include in future talks. Now, the electronic structure of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene is quite interesting. It turns out you can think of these three layers, which are tunnel coupled, okay, by, you know, a tunneling strength T as essentially magic angle twisted by layer graphene plus monolayer graphene, okay? It turns out there is a, you know, bonding anti-bonding states between these three layers such that you have, you know, your, your, your Hamiltonian, which I'm not, you know, writing down here, but becomes block diagonal where one block corresponds to magic angle twisted by layer graphene, interestingly, with a square root of two effective tunneling T, okay, X square root of two times T, okay? And then just completely another diagonal, just monolayer graphene, okay? This means that the magic angle for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene because of the square root of two in the interlayer tunneling is the one for magic angle twisted by layer graphene times square root of two. So 1.1 degrees times square root of two, so 1.56 degrees. That's a predicted theoretical magic angle for twisted trilayer graphene in this mirror symmetry configuration. Now, this means that the Moray wavelength is about nine nanometers. So it's shorter than the usual 13 nanometers more wavelength of magic angle twisted by layer graphene. Okay? And this electronic structure, okay, can be seen here. So if you do not have any displacement field applied transverse to these layers. So when this system has mirror symmetry in the electronic structure, what you can see is that the electronic structure is indeed, you have a set of flat bands. This is the magic angle twisted by layer graphene like part and disconnected, okay, orthogonal to it, you have this massless Dirac band. Yeah? And this happens at zero displacement field. Now, the system has a very tunable electronic structure and our device is consists of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene contacted by source and drain electrodes in a Horvath geometry. And we have a bottom and a top gate electrode. With these two metallic electrodes, we can apply and control the charge density on, and, you know, on filling factor and independently the transverse electric field, okay? The transverse electric displacement field. Okay? We can control these. So, if you actually apply a finite displacement field by applying opposite voltages to the top and bottom gates, you actually break the middle symmetry of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, okay? And this Dirac, this massless Dirac and the flat bands now hybridize as shown here, okay? And this electronic structure is continuously tunable between this and this as you apply <coughs> an increase in displacement field. No. Uh, sorry, Pablo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe you will mention this. I'm just curious, uh, uh, how can I view the these uh, two bands? I, I mean, specifically, like which layer contribute to which band? Yes. So you should think of this uh, in the following way. Out of these three layers, you can form bonding and anti-bonding states, okay, between the layers, okay? And one of them, one combination, okay, gives you the flat bands and another combination gives you the massless Dirac bands, okay? So in your Hamiltonian for, I mean, actually I do have a backup slide here that I can show uh, with the Hamiltonian. Let me just show you here. Did I stop sharing my screen? You stopped oh. sharing. Yeah, sorry. Let me. Why is it not? Oh, sorry, I have to share. All right. So you see, this is the Hamiltonian for these three layers of graphene, you know, which has the usual graphene Hamiltonian and the tunnel coupling between the layers. You can do a change of basis, okay? So that it becomes block diagonal between the magic angle twisted by layer graphene part, like with the square root of two coupling and the monolayer graphene, like, okay? Okay, okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. So now, um, let me go on. Oh, sorry. So this is showing, let me see. This is showing, okay. This is showing that, uh, oh, I don't know why. Okay. It stops sharing each time I, I do, I click escape, sorry. Shouldn't click escape too much. All right. So now, as I mentioned, this is, you know, transverse displacement field dependent, okay? Now, do we have experimental evidence of that coexistence of Dirac and the you know, massless Dirac and flat bands? Indeed, we do, okay? So if you measure Rxy, okay, and you take the derivative of Rxy with respect to the magnetic field as a function of filling factor and magnetic field, okay? What you see, this is a zero displacement field, okay? We see is a series of features. You know, don't worry, I know that this is a little bit complicated. I'll show easier data later on. This is just to, 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 you know, to clear that we have evidence of these two bands. You see a set of vertical features occurring at, you know, zero, one, two, three, at minus two also. Those are related to the flat bands, okay? But now you see on top of that, this, wavy features, okay? That wavy features are the Landau levels, the Landau fan diagram of the massless Dirac band, okay? How do we know that's a massless Dirac band? Well, if we go to filling factor four, okay? Where we do not have the flat bands and we're only crossing the massless Dirac band and you measure the quantum hole there, you see the typical quantum hole, you know, sigma XY has typical graphene relativistic quantum Hall effect at two, six, 10, 14 e squared over h, okay? So that tells you unambiguously that you have a massless Dirac band graphene-like, okay, there, okay? Now, you can apply then a finite displacement fill so that you get rid of this. And indeed, this thing disappears, you know? And if you're wondering why this thing is wavy like this, this is actually what you're looking here is at the chemical potential of the magic angle twisted valley graphene as explored by looking at transport through the massless Dirac band. Okay, so in this paper, you can see the details, but we're able to extract the chemical potential of the magic angle twisted valley graphene. This shows the cascade of phase transition with negative compressibility for those of you that are experts in the topic. So now let me tell you about superconductivity. So, First of all, I told you we would have to observe zero resistance. And indeed, when we measure the resistivity you know, versus temperature, we have this big drop to zero resistance. We can fit this with the hopper in formula, which allow us to extract the BKT transition temperature, which for this device is about 2.3 Kelvin. Now in the 2D materials community, we often use the 50% normal state resistance as critical temperature, that's for this device 2.9 Kelvin, is a pretty high critical temperature or TBKT, okay? Now, we also have very flat VI characteristics with sharp switching, okay? In fact, the critical currents are several times larger for the system than for magic angle twisted by graphene. You can do temperature dependence of this. You can also look at the BKT behavior by plotting this in log scale and looking at the characteristics, you get very consistent results. Now, this superconductivity is also tunable by gate voltage, similar to magic angle twisted by layer graphene. So we have superconducting domes. I'm showing here, you know, resistivity versus temperature and filling factor. This is the superconducting dome at two holes plus extra holes per more unit cell is the strongest and largest. We also have superconductivity in this region at two holes and some electron doping. We have a similar situation at two electrons per more unit cell plus extra electrons and at two electrons per more unit cell minus a few electrons, so hole doping for this, okay? And now, <coughs> the superconductivity also is subject, you know, experiences suppression with magnetic field, okay? So in particular, we see both suppression with magnetic field and also use of some phase coherence. So if you look at optimal doping where superconductivity is very strong, now you measure the critical current as a function of magnetic field, you see this decrease on something like a hundred millitesla scale with a long tail up to 
you know, half a Tesla, sometimes even more, indicating that you have a very high ultimate critical field, okay? And if you go near the edge of a superconducting dome where disorder can induce a network of Josephson junctions in your system, okay, you see this Fraunhofer-like oscillations indicated that indeed there is Josephson phase coherence, okay? So this has been seen, you know, very robustly. So this confirms that magic angle twisted trilateral graphene is a robust Moray superconductor. Now, let me tell you about the phase diagram. So as I mentioned, the system, the electronic structure of the system is tunable with an electric displacement field, okay? So that means that we can look at our phases, not only as a function of density, like in the case of magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, but also as a function of displacement field, okay? So this is the resistivity as a function of transverse displacement field and filling factor. And as you can see, this is a pretty complex phase diagram, okay? Let me guide you a little bit through it. So first of all, the light blue regions are regions where you have superconductivity, okay? The resistive features are in yellow, indicate semi-metallic and occasionally insulating behavior, but it mostly indicates highly resistive regions which are semi-metallic, okay? So as you can see, we have a resistive feature at charge neutrality, same as in graphene, same as in magic angle twisted by layer graphene. We have some resistive features at nu equals one, something happening also near nu equals two, some in some ranges of displacement field features, okay, around these regions. We similarly have some feature at nu equals minus two, okay, it's something happening at minus four, okay. As you can see, the superconductivity occurs mostly between filling factors two and three and minus two and minus three, but there are at large displacement fields branches of superconductivity in other filling factors. I will talk a lot more about this in a moment. Okay. Now, these are you know, this is a pretty complex phase diagram with lots of features. Okay. I also want to point out that there is a certain degree of symmetry. Okay. First of all, there is symmetry positive to negative displacement field. As you can see, most of the features are symmetric, positive and negative displacement field, okay? Both superconducting branches, including these little balls, you know, that we see here, but also these branches. And there is a certain degree of symmetry, much less, but also a certain degree of symmetry between electrons and holes, overall from charge neutrality electrons and holes, okay? You can see this branch and this branch, this branch and this branch, these features and these features, okay? But the degree of symmetry between electrons and holes is less, similar to magic angle twisted by layer graphene, where there is also a degree of asymmetry between the situation for electrons and holes. Now, this is quite complex. We can gain more insight about what's going on by measuring not just the resistivity, but measuring also Rxy, okay? And in particular, one over Rxy or the hole density. So, in this diagram, I'm showing the normalized hole density. So the hole density multiplied by four and divided by the super lattice density. So this is the equivalent of filling factor, okay? But for the hole density, okay? And this is a measurement of this hole density as a function of filling factor and transverse displacement field, okay? And as you can see, it also has a rich behavior, okay? Displays a rich types of behavior. Now. To zero order, most of the features in this diagram can be associated with one of the following three features that I'm going to show here, okay? You have, you know, one type of behavior we associate with gap slash Dirac type of behavior, okay? If there are a Dirac point or a small gap, okay, would give you this type of behavior. The whole density varies, you know, changes sign crossing smoothly zero, okay? This is, for example, what you see at charge neutrality, where you have Dirac behavior. You can see that we go from, you know, uh, dark blue to light blue to white to light red to darker red. That's this type of behavior, okay? A smooth sign change of the whole density. In other regions, you have what we call a reset 
of the whole density. Okay, this can be with red color or with blue color. What you have is you have an increasing whole density, which then transitions close to zero and keeps growing, but without a sign change. Okay, perhaps you can see this most clearly here. Okay, you see you go from light blue towards darker blue, darker blue, and then a transition to white, which is zero, okay, to then increases towards lighter blue and darker blue, okay? That's a reset, okay? And then you have another type of behavior which is associated with a von Hoff singularity. At a von Hoff singularity, Rxy crosses smoothly through zero, which means that whole density, which goes as one over Rxy, diverges, okay, then flips the sign and goes closer to zero, okay? So it has this sign change with a divergence type of behavior. You can see that behavior, for example, here in this region, okay? You see that we go from lighter blue to dark blue, right away dark red, and lighter red, okay? So you go from that type of transition, for example, here, and there are many other places where that takes place, okay? So there are some other details were not, which are not captured by these three types of behavior, but to zero order, most of the features look like that, okay? So now what we can do now is we can look at these two maps and try to see if we have you know, if we can correlate features here with features here, features in the whole density with features in your resistivity, okay? So I'm gonna do that, but rather than merging these two plots, which would be too complicated, what I'm gonna do is the following. I'm showing here, you know, the regions where we have superconductivity, okay? As a function of displacement field and filling factor, okay? So these darker blue regions are regions where superconductivity is very robust, okay, with relatively high critical temperatures. These light blue regions are regions where we reach zero resistance, but the critical temperature is very small, okay, so very weak superconductivity, okay. <laughs> now I'm going to put, I'm going to adhere lines that reflect the features that we see in the whole density, okay. So these lines, again, these are schematic, reflect regions where we see this gap slash Dirac type of behavior in the whole density, for example, at charge neutrality, okay? But also very often at many of the integers. Then we have resets, okay? Which occur pretty much at each integer, at most integers, except nu equals minus one, okay? These are the types of resets that we also saw in magic angle twisted by ledger graphene, this cascade of phase transitions. You remember that it's accompanied by a reset, okay, in density. And then these are the features that correspond to von Hoff singularities, the regions that correspond to von Hoff singularities. So as you can see, the superconductivity is mostly bounded by either resets or von Hoff singularities, okay? Let's look at this a bit more, okay? So if we go Pablo, back to this. Pablo, is the Van Hoff calculated or measured? Measured. Okay. Okay, they come from these features that we see here, which are Van Hoff singularities, okay? So these are measures, yeah. This is a fully experimental diagram. There's no calculations here, okay? It's schematic, but it is reflecting the experiment. So, Let's look a little bit more closely at this issue of the Van Hoffs, okay? So let's go to this region where we're crossing a Van Hoff singularity here, okay? At large displacement field. And now we can measure the resistivity as a function of filling factor. You can see the resistivity is zero in superconductivity. And then when we get close to nu equals minus three, at that point, it gets into a non-superconducting behavior, okay? Metallic resistivity, with finite resistivity. We can look at the BKT, you know, critical temperature, at the BKT temperature as a function of filling factor here. And you can see that you go from a relatively high TBKT, okay, down to zero 
here, of course, the system stops being superconducting. Now, what we can do also is we can measure the effective mass of our carriers by looking at the temperature dependence of the Shunikov, the Hass oscillations. We can measure the effective mass as a function of density as we cross this region. Okay? So this is shown here. The effective mass is proportional to the density of states. And indeed, you see this cap, you know, this diverging density of states at that region. This pink shaded region is exactly that region here where the Van Hoff singularity is, which indeed our effective mass measurements tell us there is indeed there Van Hoff singularity. Okay. And as you can see, superconducting behavior is bounded, okay, stops at the Van Hoff singularity. Okay. As we are approaching the Van Hoff, the density of states is increasing and TVKT is decreasing. It's not increasing at all. In fact, it terminates, it ends at this point, okay? So that tells you automatically that this behavior is not consistent with a weak coupling BCS type, you know, formula where your critical temperature would be proportional, you know, exponential in the density of states, okay? That's not happening here, okay? Now, I will comment uh, a lot more about this behavior uh, in a little bit. So let me tell you about our observation of ultra strong coupling superconductivity. So we can measure this TVKT versus filling factor and apply displacement field, okay? So I'm gonna show this 3D plot of displacement field, filling factor, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm showing mostly filling factors, you know, for electron doping and for hole doping, skipping the, the middle portion where we don't see superconductivity. And on the third axis, I'm showing TBKT, okay? And as you can see, it has, you know, domes which have a certain dependence of displacement field and filling factor. Let me project it onto a 2D color map here. This is, okay, what we have. As I mentioned, the strongest superconductivity, meaning the highest TBKT occurs for two holes per more unit cell plus extra holes also for two electrons per more unit cell plus extra electrons, but we also have regions of superconductivity here, here, you know, various features, okay? Now, we can look, you know, just, you know, I know that these color maps can be quite confusing, so let me show you traces of what is the <coughs> TBKT as a function of filling factor at optimal displacement field meaning at the displacement field for which we have the maximum TBKT, and also TBKT as a function of displacement field at optimal density, at optimal filling factor, okay? I'm gonna show you those two cuts so that you get a flavor of, of how things look like. So this is TBKT as a function of filling factor around the region for two holes per more unit cell, okay? So you can see, as I mentioned, we have a big TBKT superconducting dome for hole doping with respect to two holes per more unit cell, okay? If you do electron doping, you have a tiny superconducting dome. It's present, but it's one of those tiny superconducting domes that I mentioned before, okay? With a you know, TBKT of the order of 100 to 100 millikelvin. Okay, now, something that we can do is we can measure the superconducting coherence length by looking at the magnetic field dependence of the resistance versus temperature curves and fit into a Gitzmore-Landau theory, we can measure the superconducting coherence length in the system. And that is shown here, okay? You can see that the superconducting coherence length decreases to a very low value, has a minimum around optimal doping, and then increases, okay? Now, I wanna bring attention to the numbers. The, Superconducting coherence length reaches a value of about 12 nanometers. That's extremely short for this system. Yeah? Just to give you an idea, okay, let me show you what's the average interparticle distance. Remember, magic angle twisted bilayer graphene and trilayer graphene, uh, you know, these are superconductors which are the lowest charge density superconductors by several orders of magnitude compared to regular superconductors. So the average interparticle distance in this plot as a function of density is given by this, okay? As you can see, the superconducting coherence length is of the same order. In fact, it seems to be bounded in the underdope region. It seems to be bounded 
by the interparticle distance, okay? We can do the same thing as a function of displacement field at optimal doping density. So TVKT, you know, increases, it has this broad maximum and then decreases rapidly as a function of displacement field. You can measure the superconducting coherence length as a function of displacement field. This is the interparticle, average interparticle distance at this optimal density. And as you can see again, it seems that near, you know, optimal displacement field, the superconducting coherence length is bounded by the interparticle distance, okay? Now, in the VCS limit, you typically interpret the superconducting coherence length as the size of your Cooper pair, okay? So what this is telling you is that at optimal doping, the Cooper pair size is of the order or smaller than the average interparticle distance. I mentioned it could possibly be smaller because as you go to this regime, okay, it's not obvious that you can interpret the superconducting coherence length as a Cooper pair size, okay? Cooper pair size could be actually smaller than superconducting coherence length. Now, this is very reminiscent, the fact that, you know, we have now Cooper pairs, which are of size of order, the interparticle distance of what happens when you're in proximity to the VC, to the VCS BC crossover, okay? So this is a plot from the Mohit van der Rie's review on, you know, VCS to VC crossover behavior. Okay, in a phase diagram where you have here temperature, you know, versus, you know, normalized by Fermi energy versus, you know, coupling strength, okay, you have that deep in the BCS limit, you know, your, your super, you know, your Cooper pairs uh, has a size which is much larger than the interparticle distance. In the BEC limit, you have tightly bound, you know, pairs, you know, where your condensed you know, pairs have a size which are much smaller than the interparticle distance. And typically this crossover, okay, is defined, or, or one way of looking at the crossover is as the region where your Cooper pair size is of order the interparticle distance, okay? Now, the, in three dimensions, the critical temperature versus Fermi temperature, the ratio of TC versus TF is bounded by 0.22 and it happens at the crossover. Okay, has a maximum there. In two dimensions, okay, you have to speak of TBKT. Okay, TBKT, the ratio of TBKT and TF is actually bounded by 0.125 and it is reached at the crossover. Okay, now we can investigate this in our system. Again, we can measure the Fermi temperature because we can measure the density and effective mass. Okay, so and we measure also TBKT. So this is a measurement of the effective mass in our system as a function of filling factor, okay? This is a extracted TBKT, I mean the measured TBKT versus TF, okay? As a function of filling factor in the system, okay? As you can see, there is a non-monophonic behavior. You can do the same thing at optimal density. This is at optimal, at optimal displacement field versus filling factor. This is at optimal filling factor versus displacement field, okay? And you can look at TVKT versus TF. And then this is the line that corresponds to 0.125, okay? Now, I don't want, you know, so TVKT over TF reaches values in excess of 0.1 with a maximum actually around 0.125. Now one should be careful, okay? In, in, in trying to make too much out of this 0.125 experimentally seen here because this bound that is calculated theoretically is for the case of uh, cold atoms, okay, where the boson has clearly twice the mass of each of the fermionic atoms that, you know, both condensed, okay? It's not obvious that for a system of electrons, you know, whatever thing condenses, okay, these pairs of electrons have a mass which is twice the effective mass of the individual electrons. That's not obvious, okay? But still, experimentally, this is what we obtain. Now, in, you know, one way of characterizing uh, superconductors is by looking at how high is their critical temperature versus their Fermi temperature, okay? This is something which is typically shown in a, in a so-called Uemura plot, okay? In a log-log scale. This line is temperature equal to Fermi temperature. These are the critical temperatures of many 3D superconductors. This is the bound, the, the line which corresponds to the VEC-VCS crossover in three dimensions, okay? 
In this purple band, you have most of the unconventional superconductors. You know, conventional superconductors tend to be here. As you go in this direction, you go towards more exotic superconductivities. Okay, and in this purple band, you find the cuprates, the nictites, the organics, the heavy fermions. If you take critical temperature 50% normal star resistance of magic angle twisted ballet graphene, it's here, it's one of the strongest coupled superconductors that exist. This is the line for T equal TBKT. And if we now put the data for magic angle twisted ballet graphene, looking at TBKT, not 50% normal state resistance, you see here, okay, this data point. If you look at the corresponding quantities, 50% normal state resistance and TBKT for magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, we're here. This is the strongest couple two-dimensional superconductor that exists. If you normalize and compare to 3D, it's also the strongest couple superconductor that exists, okay? Um, I should mention that just a paper just appeared by Yoshi Iwasha with another um, layered superconductor, which has very strong coupling also reaching this line, okay? I, for, you know, I, I didn't have time to include that data point. This was just a couple of days ago. Okay. So now in the last few minutes, let me tell you about the deep connection that exists between the flavor symmetry broken state at nu equals two and superconductivity. So where does superconductivity emerge from in the system, okay? Well, you have this diagram and you can see that superconductivity for the most part is happening, is bounded by these resets Okay, these orange lines, or by Funkhoff singularities gap dirac. Okay, so the resets bound the superconductivity at small displacement field. Funkhoff singularities and gap dirac behavior bound the superconductivity at large displacement field. Okay, certainly all of the regions with very strong superconductivity. Some regions with weak superconductivity may be a little bit anomalous, although we do have signatures of a Funkhoff singularity here, it's very weak. Okay, you can look at the paper for details. Now, this is the behavior. At small d, resets. At large c, Van Hoff singularities plus gap Dirac. So what's going on here? Okay. We can look and gain more insight about what are the carriers responsible for superconductivity by looking at the landon fan diagrams, by looking at the resistivity versus magnetic fields. And what happens, what we see is the following. At small displacement fields, okay, all of the landau fan diagram, the Shunikov de Cass oscillations, they all point away from charge neutrality, outwards in this direction, okay? To the right, in the right, to the left, on the left of charge neutrality, okay? This is the behavior which is seen also in magic angle twisted by ledger graphene, okay? What is happening is at each integer, there is a, this phase transition, you know, this cascade of phase transitions you are transitioning from one state to another flavor polarized state, and it's the carriers in that flavor polarized state that give rise to the lambda fan diagram. Okay? There are no lambda fan diagrams in the opposite direction because to go in the opposite direction, what you're doing is just you're going, you're undoing the phase transition. You're going to a state which started from here. Okay? That's why at each integer, the lambda fan diagrams go outwards. What we see is that at small displacement field, superconductivity is bounded between feeling factor two and three because that means that it is these flavor symmetry broken state with two Fermi surfaces, which is responsible for superconductivity. How do we know that? Okay, well, an advantage of magic angle twisted trilayer graphene versus the bilayer case is that we can tune all of this with displacement field. So if you go to large displacement field, now you have lambda fan diagrams that go outwards, okay? But you also have lambda fan diagrams that go inwards, okay? In some regions. The most important piece of evidence for determining what, you know, is critical for the superconductivity out of which many body ground state the superconductivity is emerging is what is happening in this region where we have a lambda fan diagram that is going inwards, okay? At nu equals two, okay? This thing is happening here in this region. So what's going on, okay? What do we believe that it's going on is the following. At small displacement field, you know, as you go from, you know, let's start from charge neutrality. You're feeling four flavors, 
you have a reset, you know, a phase transition. One flavor is polarized. Now you're filling the remaining three flavors. You have another reset. Two flavors are polarized, two flavors are empty. The system here has two Fermi surfaces, and it is as you add carriers to the many body ground state that happens after this phase transition, that superconductivity emerges. Okay? At high displacement field, what seems to be happening is the following. This form of singularity, okay, seems to trigger the phase transition to the many body ground state with two Fermi surfaces at an earlier filling factor before nu equals two, okay? Because it is happening at before nu equals two, is triggering that phase transition to a, a many body ground state with two Fermi surfaces, but rather than going close to charge neutrality, it seems to be going into the whole part of the Dirac spectrum, okay? That's why you have whole like carriers with a land of fan diagram pointing inwards, okay? And that's why you cross a Dirac point here, okay? So this funk of singularity seems to trigger the phase transition to the many body ground state with two Fermi surfaces, okay? The one that would occur at charge neutrality here. And now, if you add electrons to that many body ground state, you have superconductivity. If you add holes to that many body ground state, you add superconductivity, okay? So these are superconducting carrier, you know, superconducting regions which emerge from the same many body ground state with two Fermi surfaces, which at charge neutrality they give you this Dirac type of behavior. Okay? So schematically, you can again look at this in this way. If you plot what is the actual filling of the flavor, you know, of the states that are not completely occupied versus filling factor, at small displacement field, you're filling, you know, the four flavors, then there is a reset. You're filling three flavors, there is a reset. You're filling two flavors. When you fill two flavors in purple, there you go. Now you have superconductivity. The same thing happens between two holes and three holes per mole unit cell, okay? Now, at the intermediate displacement field, you have this Van Hoff singularity appear, which allows you to have these resets, but into hold doping, you know, earlier, okay? And at large displacement field, we see this behavior much more pronounced, okay? We also see it on the whole region, okay? So you have superconductivity in both of these cases, but it comes from adding carriers to this many body ground state with two flavors, which are charge neutrality would be a nu equals two, okay? So now let me summarize and, and just tell you, you know, a, a couple of words about what's coming. So, I hope to have convinced you that we have now the first robust more superconductor beyond magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. This is magic angle twisted trilayer graphene, okay? It has exceptional tunability, not only with charge density, but also with electric displacement field. There is a non-trivial interplay with Van Hoff singularities where the Van Hoff singularities doesn't give you enhanced superconductivity, but rather are the boundaries of the superconducting regions in certain parts of the phase diagram, a large displacement field. But there's an non-trivial role because Van Hoff singularities can enhance phase transitions, okay? Because interactions are more pronounced near Van Hoff singularities. Now, the system exhibits ultra strong coupling strength, okay? And I have shown you that there is a deep connection between the superconducting state and the broken flavor symmetry state with two Fermi surfaces, which occurs at nu equals two, okay? Now, in terms of outlook, well, we have a, recipe in principle, you know, we have all the twist angles, you know, the magic angles for all the twisted structures in this alternating twist family, okay? There are infinite of them. We just have to keep adding layers. So I hope, you know, sometime in the, you know, in the near to midterm future, either my group or some other group will be reporting on more magic 4.0, 5.0, etc. okay? Now, this paper and a subsequent paper on skirmionic superconductivity makes an interesting prediction. They say that C to Z T, okay? T is time reversal symmetry. C to Z is a rotation, uh, 180 degree rotation uh, on the uh, on an, uh, Z axis is essential for the superconductivity in the system. In fact, they claim that the reason why magic angle twisted valley graphene has robust superconductivity while all the other systems 
ABC trilayer, twisted by by, twisted mono by, twisted T and this do not is because all those other systems do not have C to C T symmetry. Okay, so is it essential or not? Okay, we will continue to look at this by exploring other C2 symmetric options as well as non C2 symmetric options and indeed seeing which ones correspond to robust superconductivity. And finally, it would be of course very interesting to investigate what's the symmetry of the other parameter. Okay, in this theory proposal, the mechanism for superconductivity is purely electronic and is due to skirmians. Okay, it's a very interesting phenomena. We do not know if this is the case we have to explore all options and experimentally and see and see what will happen. So then I just want to end by acknowledging my fantastic group members and collaborators. You know, this work that I showed today was mostly the result of John Sao and Jane Park with some uh, also help from Daniel Rodan Legrain and the compressibility data were taken together with the Shahal Ilanis group. And, you know, we have plenty other collaboration with plenty of other groups that I'm acknowledging here, but I didn't have time to tell you about, and of course, always good to thank our funding agencies and uh, friends. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, Pablo. Um, so yeah, let's open up the floor to questions. Well, uh, I have a short question, I guess. Um, is if I if I talk about the ratio of TC to T Fermi, is that largest at zero displacement field or at larger displacement field? Like okay. where does this thing look like it's most strong coupling? Yes, the 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 optimal the optimal doping optic. Oh, there is a little bit of you know there is not a single optimal doping optimal electric field point. Okay. But it's actually just a very small region. So optimal doping, and there is a region of roughly optimal doping and optimal electric field, and it's a finite displacement field. Okay, I, I know I showed the cuts. You know, I, I uh, we have the map of the TBKT over TEF, and the maximum is very close to both maxima of optimal doping and optimal electric field. Okay, there is a sort of a little bit of a diagonal, but it's mostly that. Let me let me show you here. Where do I have? I, I think this is probably the, the best. All option. right. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, this is optimal doping at uh, optimal electric field, and this is optimal uh, electric field TVKT and at optimal doping density, and and these two points are very close to each other. Okay. This is a slight diagonal for holes. For electrons, we have sort of a a little bit more of a diagonal reach and the details, you can you can look at the details. I mean, that information is partly embedded in, in, in this. The dependence on effective mass is less strong than the dependence on uh, density uh, on uh, TBKT, okay? Depends more strongly on density and electric field than the effective mass. So you can see this is, those regions correspond. Here you have a little bit of a diagonal, as you can see. Uh, okay, thank you. It, it's tempting to take this as evidence that gapping out that sort of trivial direct band is helpful for superconductivity. Well, it's kind uh, of interesting, you know. The the you know, I remember there are there are a few there are, there is, there is there are a number of theory papers that you know well, well before magic angle twisted ballet graphene trilate etc you know, from the, from the early 2000s and even some in the 90s, I think, where they claim that the best place to look for very strong coupling superconductivity and, and you know, high TC temperature is in systems where there is a coexistence of flat bands and the Iraq bands. And they were thinking at the time of carbomelatices where you have flat bands and Dirac bands coexisting. And they said that the flat bands give you the strong correlations and the Dirac bands give you, you know, high mobility electrons, which, you know, can contribute, you know, nicely to make the superconductivity very established, you know, uh, they can give you superfluid density. And they said that there's a sweet spot, you know, between having enough of both that it will give you very strong superconductivity. And th again, this is theory work. I don't think experimentally there is too much known about that. So my motivation initially from you know, last year when we started to think about going in this direction was actually those theory papers because I knew that the trilayer system would have coexisting Dirac and flat bands. As you say, with the displacement field, you, you, you 
gap, you, you run the direct point, you split the direct point into two direct points that you run and hybridize with the flat bands, okay? And this region we believe happens as those points are about to cross, you know, the, the flat bands, as they're, as, as they're about to go out of the flat band region, you know? So it's, it's, it's interesting. I think, I think there is, you know, you guys have a lot of homework, I hope, to do, to look exactly at what's going on there, you know, because also, of course, those points are associated with, you know, Fanghoff singularities, which are changing in this, you know, in energy with displacement field, etc. So I think it's quite interesting that interplay. Okay, thank you. So Pablo, I had a question, this is Shankar. So just looking at the data, Mm -hmm. uh, not and not taking into account uh, and Ashin's very nice theory about uh, C two ZT symmetry breaking. Sure. If I just take your data at face value, of course it's very rich, and I have not absorbed everything. Uh, one key aspect that you emphasize very strongly is that the superconductivity onset is closely connected with symmetry breaking. And it happens when the symmetry breaking is, let's say, maximal in some, in some crude sense, you know, when, when both symmetries are broken. So that kind of, you know, on a very naive uh, uh, picture, that would indicate that there are bosonic excitations associated with the symmetry breaking, which may be playing a role in providing the glue. I mean, again, you know, I don't want to bias anything. I'm just looking at your results. And I don't want to make profound claims of, you know, strange or unknown, I'm saying, okay, what is he telling me? Let me connect that with what I know about superconductivity. And we know there are all kinds of Skarmian is one possibility. There could be Magnum, there could be Valley Magnum. And it's possible that they, for reasons we do not understand right now, are very, very strong glues. And that will kind of connect both your, your uh, uh, version three with things that we know before from your earlier work, they're not inconsistent. Is this a picture, is this very vague proof picture? Uh, do you have strong opposition to it or do you think something like this may very well be going on? I, I, I totally agree with what you said, okay? Mm -hmm. let's, let's for a moment not consider specific mechanisms. Right. I think what the data are telling us very right. clearly is that superconductivity happens when you add electrons or holes to a many body ground state, okay? Which has broken the flavor symmetry such that there are now two Fermi surfaces. Right. If you are electrons or you are holes, there are two Fermi surfaces that are being occupied, yeah. okay, or that are dominant, okay, in the system. Mm -hmm. We see that from the land of diagrams. And this, in fact, you know, this also is telling us this behavior, we didn't have the richness of the displacement field, which allowed us to see right. you know, the right. land diagrams coming mm -hmm. in both directions, you know, for, for in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. You know, in, in, in the bilayer, there was always a little bit of this, is the superconducting dome only happening for holes and then for electrons or can you dope on the other side of the correlated insulator? And because some samples show it, some samples know what's the influence of disorder, okay? Yeah. What I believe now is that depending on the samples, that mechanism, same mechanism can happen in yes. twisted bilayer graphene. Yes. Now is that we have it under control so we can show how exactly it happens. But I think uh, the physics very, very likely is the same for the bilayer right. and for the trilayer case. And right. it involves what you said. There's a breaking of flavor symmetry, yeah, that mm -hmm. for some reason creates these two flavors which are very conducive to superconductivity. And, and this breaking of symmetry, as you know, comes in bosonic modes. So at least, it, it, you know, this overcomes my, uh, my uh, aesthetic objection to general electron-electron interaction mediated superconductivity because Coulomb interaction is repulsive. Somehow you have to overcome that. And I don't want to overcome that just by waving of hands. You know, I want to see some, but, but this gives a direct possibility. Again, of course, it's strong coupling. So how to do it? And this is actually very, very interesting because in high TC materials, we do not have insight like this because you don't have so many tuning parameters like you have, okay? Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is actually very interesting. And this will also explain why things don't, occurred with density of state maximum, you know, as you pointed out, Van Holt, because let's say phonon, you know, the mechanism I'll first suggest because most superconductors are phonon mediated. You correctly point out that's why it should be maximum, but that's why Coulomb interaction is maximum also, it will be suppressed. So it's very interesting. I think that this connection to symmetry breaking that you are seeing, we have to take very, very seriously now. Yeah. Now I will point out that, um, 
you know, you know, now, now you know, I mean, I, I think it's fair to give a little bit of, you know, to, to, to appreciate the fact that Ashwin proposed this thing. And we were totally motivated to explore and we made the devices at the exact twist angle they predicted mm -hmm. and it's like dead on, okay? So yeah. we, you know, their mechanism is purely electronic. No mm -hmm. phonons, no other, you know, it's purely electronic, this is yes. communes. But of course, it's one option. And we, you know, I, I think, you know, the theorists have to explore all options, you know, the system. I think the system is now quite constrained because again, there's so many tuning parameters. If you make a prediction, now it has to explain many things, you know, because we have a lot of uh, parameters. I encourage you to look at, you know, the, uh, at the paper, which has a lot more data in the supplementary, etc. No, I'm, yeah, I was waiting for your talk data. before I read the paper, yeah. Um, so another question is that, uh, again, this is something you may or may not know. In TMD materials, it doesn't look like there is convincing evidence for superconductivity. Corey had some little thing, but recently I talked to him, he's kind of a little backpedaling. He's not sure what he, what he tells me. That's right, that's right. This is what I mentioned in, in, in this slide. These are in fact, um, these are Corey's data, actually, yeah. the twisted yeah. TMD. Yeah. Well, he mm -hmm. saw an insulating behavior that's clear, and then he saw some resistance curves. Right. The resistance gets close to zero, but in a mm -hmm. in a smooth way. You know, you can have in these mesoscopic systems, you can have zero resistance for many reasons. Actually, exactly, you know, including mm -hmm. ballistic, and you know. So they, you know, there's no just some phase coherence. The IV curves look nonlinear but smooth, no sharp switching. There's a paper by Matt Jankovic that in the context of twisted bilayer bilayer graphene, he claims that it's definitely not superconductivity. Right, right. That's exactly critical, what Corey thinks maybe. Yeah. Critical behavior. Right. right. I think, you know, I think the jury is still out. Okay. You know, Manchester recently had this mono on bilayer claiming that it is actually superconductivity, although the resistance doesn't reach zero. Um, I think the jury is still out. Maybe the system wants to become a superconductor, but this is very fragile for some reason. We mm -hmm. don't know why. And it doesn't end up giving you proper phase coherence and proper you know, standard superconducting, robust superconducting behavior. So I think the jury is still out on, on those other systems. Okay, But indeed, at the beginning, there were many claims that people are now being more cautious. Okay. Okay, one last quick question in the data you showed today. Did you look at the metallic temperature dependence at all? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know course. it's an obvious question. I mean, of course. Really of course. Yeah. <laughs> as, as you may imagine, it also exhibits strongly linear temperature. It is linear. Behavior mm -hmm. in, in, a, you know, in a certain range around certain filling factors and so on. And we're, we're trying to do you know, more measurements. But yes, okay. of course, also. But is, is it in your paper? I mean, I'm just curious. I'm, I'm not working in on the paper. paper the, I, I, it, I don't remember. We discussed about whether to show it or not in the- Okay, we'll, we'll talk about it because I'm- I don't remember if in the latest version we included it or not, but it's- okay. uh, but, but you do see linear in T behavior. We see, with, we see okay. behavior where it's mostly linear or slightly sublinear, definitely not quadratic in okay. regions where we see correlated behavior and so on. Okay. Now, okay. it's interesting, we all want us to watch out. So for example, some people ask me, oh, do you see correlated insulators or not? Well, you know, we do see features, resistive features at new equals at the, at the integers. But you have to remember that now we have a Dirac band in parallel yep. conducting, yep. right? So yep. you're not going to see an insulating behavior if you have Dirac electrons conducting in parallel, Correct. right? Correct. So where, whether, the, whether the flat bands are getting gapped due to interactions or not, but you still have the Dirac band, you know? So, you know, this, this feature is a resistive feature. Here in some regions, we see resistive feature when, whenever superconductivity doesn't completely overwhelm it. Okay, we see a resistive feature. It's not insulating, it's mm -hmm. semi-metallic, but again, we have the Dirac band. Now, these features more prominent at large displacement field, there we're starting to get rid of the Dirac band in some sense, but not, not gapping it out. We're just, you know, okay, so one has to watch out. Some of these very, very yellow features, okay, they do correspond to actual insulating behavior. And this occurs in at points where we think we're running the Van Hoff's plus, you know, the chemical potential in the region. So, you know, we still have a lot to understand, you know, because as you can see, this behavior is very complex, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, we need basically a lot of you guys uh, <laughs> helping us.
Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. So Pablo, can I ask about this uh, this slide? Uh, so about the correlated insulator, did you uh, try to see the magnetic field dependence? Yes. So this 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 states very, that's a very interesting question, and and I don't believe we put those data in the paper because there's interesting stuff that we want to check. You know, I mean, uh, I can just say it. I mean, of course, we have churn insulators and we have all kinds of things like that. You know, um, there is there is indeed. Um, uh, th this behavior at the integers, they become more insulating at finite magnetic field, yes. More insulating at finite More insulating at finite magnetic field in general. Although again, you have to watch out because the flat Dirac band is giving you also a slightly different behavior in the magnetic field than the flat bands will give you, but yes. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, For example, let me, let me put it this way, here, where we see that resistivity, the superconductivity breaches here, it's present even at nu equals two, okay? In this narrow displacement field, because it's very robust. Okay? This is close to optimal doping, um, to optimal electric field. If we apply a small magnetic field and kill superconductivity, there is a resistive peak here also underneath, okay? So I have a question about the displacement field. Uh, so since you show that uh, uh, the, the strongest superconductivity actually happen at a finite displacement field. Yeah. Um, and uh, you also have this uh, very nice uh, explanation that the uh, displacement field can tune the Van Hoel singularity, singularity. But at the same time, you also mentioned that uh, the superconductivity is not consistent with the theory predicted by Van Hoel uh, mechanism. So I'm just curious, how can I understand this uh, Strongest uh, superconductivity and a finite magnetic, mm. uh, finite displacement. Yeah. Yeah, indeed, that's a very good question. The role of the Van Hoff singularities is is non-trivial. Okay, it is not enhancing TBKT, but it is being close to a Van Hoff singularities allows your electrons to explore it to see that there is oh, high density states there. You know, Coulomb interactions room mm, suddenly are even you know, more pronounced, you know, because of the high density of states. So I remember that Antoine George, the, you know, the flat iron, they published a paper a few months ago where they did their, the, uh, the MRG numerical studies and they saw to their surprise, they don't understand it. They say in the paper, we don't understand it, but this is what the numerics tells us that even in the strong coupling, you know, large U over W, you know, large interaction versus bandwidth limit. When they do their numerical studies, the presence and how close to the Fermi level is a Van Hoff singularity turns out to play a crucial role in the correlated physics. And this was a surprise because they thought in the strong coupling limit, who cares? The density of states plays no role, I don't care. Well, it actually plays a major role, okay? For example, for the appearance of the pseudo gap phase and many things. So I remember when I discussed with him, he told me, you know, Van Gogh's are highly non-trivial, you know. They, you know, to have a Van Gogh nearby, even if it's not at the Fermi energy, is giving you stuff, you know, the electrons can explore, you know, uh, electronic structure, you know, and they can, if they see that there's a remote Van Gogh singularity, that influences the many body ground state of the system. Now, that type of influence, so we sort of think what we're seeing is that it triggers the transition to this flavor polarized phase at an earlier doping, okay? So in fact, our collaborators at the Feynman Institute, at the Weizmann Institute, when, when we published the cascade of phase transition papers, they made a very simple problem, uh, a calculation, you know, uh, hartree fock with uh, a simple density of states, but they also did some calculations. Okay, let's imagine we just add up on hope, what would happen? And it seems to indeed trigger that cascade of phase transitions at earlier doping, okay? So do we think that, that of, some of that physics may be present here and it has to look you know, more closely theoretically, okay? So it's a non-trivial role that the Van Gogh singularity plays. It's not giving you an enhancement of TC, okay? In fact, it's killing you, you know, but you know, in two dimensions, one of singularities can lead to many instabilities. So that that's you know, part of the game. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any further questions?
All right, if not, let's thank Pablo again for a wonderful talk. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, everyone. And Pablo, we are going to see you again starting one. So you have some That's time right. to get some That's right. lunch. Yeah. <laughs>